Welcome to Life in the Pit, a podcast about the lives and adventures of instrumentalists within the wonderful world of musical theater. And now, here is your host, David Lane. And hello, everybody. Welcome to episode number 67. It is great to be with you once again, and I hope that everybody is doing well. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started. First of all, I uh, just want to try something new. Uh, I was told this week that the ratings are for the podcast are more important than review. So if you haven't done so, or it's been a while, uh, I believe you can even do this on Spotify now, wherever you get your podcasts. If you just find where you can leave a rating or review, don't even worry about the review. Just leave a rating, hopefully five stars, um, if, if that's something you would consider as an honest rating. If you would, go ahead and do that. We would just love to get those numbers up. And we're very thankful to, to all of you who have done so already. And uh, also, just want to mention, and you, you'll find a link in our show notes to Fonz, if you have any kind of a studio, whether, you, whether it's music or whether it's yoga, martial arts, academic tutor, fitness coach, Fonz has a system that will make your life easier. And if you, so if you're spending more than a few minutes per week on your business with, with administration work, definitely check out Fonz. And there is a 14-day free trial that you can get through the link that's in the show notes. That link is also on our website at lifeinthepitpod.com. Something I haven't really talked about much before, and this might be of interest to anybody who's thinking of starting a podcast and is going to have it be a guest-centered podcast such as this one, uh, and, and that is, how do I get my guests? Well, the ma majority of the guests on probably the first 30, 35 episodes were people that I knew, or they were people that my friends knew. Eventually, some of the guests that I didn't previously know started referring me to some of their friends and colleagues. This has really helped my family of guests to grow on this podcast. But on this instance, I had a listener recommend this guest that I'm going to be talking to in a moment. And uh, he shared some videos, shared a uh, press clip, and... And I was able to learn that uh, this person was currently in a retirement center in Connecticut, but he had had a fascinating life in both theater and in film. Namely, he was the music director for Annie from, uh, I'm not positive if, it's, if he started in 1977 or 1978, um, seen a couple of different um, places list either one. But he, he held that position until 1983. And he taught several girls uh, along the way the role of Annie. And we're going to be chatting about that. He also uh, is the dance music arranger for the critically acclaimed film All That Jazz from 1979 that stars Roy Scheider and is directed by Bob Fosse. And in addition, if you watch that movie... He's in the movie as the pianist in the rehearsal scenes. So those are two major projects, one in film, one in theater. And so I want to thank the uh, listener who recommended me to this guest. And, and just so you know, I would normally never do this. I would never mention the name of a listener who had any message to me that was sent privately without their permission uh, in advance. Uh, however, my guest, Arnie Gross, mentions this person by name, and, and that is, his name is Bob Marks, and he is a singing coach uh, from New York City, and um, Arnie wanted me to promote his book, and that book is called 88 Keys to Successful Singing Performances. So uh, I'll also mention that again, once again at the end, uh, but Bob, thank you for introducing me and Arnie. And we had a great chat that I recorded, and so now I'm going to present that conversation to you. Here is Arnie Gross. So it's my pleasure today to welcome Arnie Gross onto the podcast. Arnie, welcome, and thank you for taking time to chat with me today. Thank you. It is my pleasure. Um, so I came into 
musical theater in my 30s. And uh, it was it was something that I you know immediately fell in love with. But I I grew into wanting to become a musician because of film. So it's really a great pleasure. It's like past and present selves, are, you know, are getting a thrill to talk to you because you've been in a critically acclaimed, well, more, multiple Broadway shows, but also in a critically acclaimed film with all that jazz. And I look forward to yeah. just chatting about those two sides, uh, you know, those that those two experiences, you know, in a great creative decade like the '70s. So, sure. um, yeah. Let's just start off with uh, how did you get into music, and then how did you get into theater? How far back you want me to go? <laughs> uh, however far you feel like talking. Well, my parents were both professional musicians. They met when they were attending New York University mm -hmm. as music teachers. My dad was a piano major and a trombone and tuba minor. Mm. My mother was contralto, operatic contralto, and she was a piano minor. So at one point or another, they met. I don't know the whole story. And uh, a few years later, I came along. Um, they moved into a home in Rigo Park, Queens, New York, which we like to joke and say it was the poor side of the tracks from Forest Hills. Mm -hmm. Forest Hills was where two or three very musical families lived. One of my dad's best friends was a fellow named Harold Hanberger, which everybody knows better as Hal Hastings. He changed his name for show business. He went into uh, Tickets, Please, was an early musical with the Hartmans, Grace and Paul Hartman. I don't know the year, right. but he went in pianist, but he didn't want to do eight performances a week. So he and my dad split the show. Nice. And... Uh, it was convenient for them. Hal and his family lived in Forest Hills. My dad and his family, my, my family, lived in Rico Park. And we were very close for a long time. My father taught Hal's two daughters piano. Mm. My mom was also a teacher. She taught me for a while. And then when I got good enough, my father took me over. I will always be thankful to my dad for insisting that I learn how to sight read. Right. He put huge pile. We had three panels in the house and a gorgeous Steinway Grand in the living room. And we had two panels in the basement, which was the teaching studio. We had a Kranich and Bach upright. We had a Chickering Baby Grand. I used to sit at the Baby Grand, put a huge pile of music on the right side of the piano to the right of the music rack, and each time I sat down, he would take a new piece off and said, okay, play it, read it. One piece after another, I had to go, I could not go back and correct mistakes. Mm. He insisted that I get it right as much as possible the first time. And he forced me to side read. And it was the best thing he could have done for me. Wow. So that, that was how I, I don't know my age at the time. I was probably eight or nine. My first experience with any Broadway show, <laughs> my dad was out of town in New Haven on a tryout of a flop show called Flahooly. Mm. Flahooly was a show with marionettes, the Bill Baird marionettes, Irwin Corey, Barbara, Barbara Cook in a ingenue role. She was unknown at the time. Can you picture Barbara Cook unknown? Wow. And yeah, it was Barbara Cook, Irwin Corey, Jerome Cortland. I don't remember the rest of the cast, but it was a fabulous show. So I went out of town with my mom by train to New Haven from New York. And we met him there. We stayed a couple of days. I saw the show. I was introduced and I shook hands with all the marionettes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And it was the best experience I could have had. I literally fell in love with Broadway. I got home. I had the cast album. I memorized every note of the orchestration. I could tell you what instrument played what in every part of that show. My parents realized right away that I was doing something a little unusual. Hmm. And they nurtured it. And that's where I came from. That's, that's the whole story. 
in well, a nutshell. Nice. Um, did you go on? To, did you have professional training in arranging and orchestration and composing? Yes and no. I did. I had professional training in piano. Mm -hmm. I was an oboe and English horn major at Manhattan School of Music. I did one one semester at Juilliard, then I transferred to Manhattan because their music education program at the time was better. Actually, better than Juilliard. Juilliard was better for performers. Mm -hmm. So I went to Manhattan School. I had a wonderful education there. And I never had real training in arranging. It just was one of those things... It came naturally. Mm. I could hear anything. I always had perfect pitch mm. for the time it which helped a little, not not a whole lot. Right. No trouble analyzing music. Mm -hmm. I didn't know the details of the inversions. Couldn't right. remember the in chords, couldn't remember what they were called, but I knew everything about them. I could hear everything. So when I went into Manhattan school, they gave me a placement exam. And they passed me off on my sight singing and my dictation immediately on my placement exam. They put me in third year dictation hmm. and third year sight singing. I just passed it off. And I got the rest of my training in Manhattan School, uh, not officially on arranging per se, but that was always my interest. Mm -hmm. And my career has been very all over the map. Right. All over the map. Right. Well, uh, I think we'll, let's start uh, just kind of getting yourself to Broadway. I, I call this section the, uh, the the road to Annie. I think we'll just call okay. it that. Uh, so I, I just I, I didn't check the order of this. I know you've been involved in Company, Follies, and Cabaret. So yes. just take us on your journey on those shows, especially. Well, Cabaret was one of the early ones. I don't remember the year. Mm -hmm. Joel Gray was still in it at that point. My dad was playing. Uh, she loves me at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, what was the name of the show? Fiorello was on Broadway, and I went in to watch from the pit to watch him, and I learned what he was doing. His double was always piano and celeste and accordion. He was a fine classical accordionist, mm -hmm. in addition to being a heck of a classical pianist, concert pianist. But he played all of them well. And I went in to watch Fiorello, which had an accordion and piano book. She Loves Me, which also had accordion and piano. And She Loves Me had Celeste, had a lot of solo Celeste. And it was the first show I ever subbed in, too. Nice. Uh, that was the beginning of actual playing. I went, in, I went on from that into doing industrials. You know about industrials? No. Uh, industrials were basically product announcement shows oh. for, for the salesman. They were put on for the salesman and the sales force of a company, uh, and they would be done by the manufacturers who would go to, they would spare no expense, put on shows. I did four or five years of shows at the Waldorf Astoria Grand Ballroom for Millican mm. Fabric. They were conducted by Peter Howard, who eventually became the conductor of Annie when it first opened. And that's where he knew me from. That's how I got into Annie. What else can I skip? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what is it that you did? Uh, so you, you were a pianist on these other shows, Company, yeah. the cap yes. Cabaret? Yeah. Were you yeah. there from the beginning, or did you come in later? No, I can't really open the only one I came in on the beginning of, well, this is this goes back a little bit again to talking about Hal Hastings, who used to use my dad as a pianist. Mm -hmm. My father was a rehearsal pianist on Pajama Game, mm -hmm. which was Hal's show. And after a couple of years of working with Hal, my father used to answer the phone. And if it was Hal, my mom would pick it up. Dad, or Irv, she would say, it's for you, it's Hal. <clears throat> One year, Hal called, my mom answered, and Hal said, no, I don't want to speak to Irv, I want to speak to Arnie. <laughs> and my father was thrilled. He was, he was beaming from ear to ear. Turned out the reason was, 
I had been playing organ, legitimate organ, pedals and all, in two or three churches, synagogues, and I never really studied organ. Well, that's another story. I think we have time for that in another minute or two. Right. But the uh, choral teacher in the high school I went to, which was Forest Hills High, was a wonderful organist. His name was Carlton Ennis. And Carl had a wonderful sense of humor. We did a show in play production in high school, which called for organ music in the second act. Mm. Off stage, you're supposed to hear an organ playing, Oh, Promise Me, which was one of those tunes which was always used at weddings for years and years, a chestnut. And they always used a recording. And Carl said to me, Arnie, why don't you play it on the organ? We have a Hammond organ here. I said, I've never played organ. He said, ah, it's easy. I'll teach you in five minutes. <laughs> he sat me down. He said, look, there are two manuals. The bottom one is called the great keyboard because it sounds great. <laughs> the upper one is called the swell because it sounds swell. <laughs> <laughs> and then he told me about the draw bars. Yeah. Do you know about yes. the organ? <laughs> Tell me about the Hammond organ drawbars. He said, the Hammond organ can sound like any instrument in the world except an organ. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction to playing organ. And then on, from there on, he just said, okay, sit down and play. Showed me how to turn it on, how to warm it up. And then I learned on my own. But yeah. he was fabulous, fabulous teacher. Nice. My mom and dad, both at one point or another, my, both my parents taught at Forest Hills High. Not at the same time. That would have been impossible. My father was the first one. I was in the school. I was playing saxophone, alto sax. And when they auditioned for the band, the head of music there, Milton Fink, who was a bassist, mm -hmm. uh, auditioned me, and he said, you play very well. How's your side reading? Well, me, side reading? I had no trouble because mm. of all the piano. Right. So I, he gave me some music to read. I side read them on sax. He was very impressed. He said, how long have you been playing? <laughs> I said, a week. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know anything about sax before that. My mother had played saxophone in high school. Mm -hmm. She still had her old Buescher alto. It was in pretty bad shape. We fixed it up. I played it. So I learned how to play sax. She was my first saxophone teacher. Mm -hmm. And I went on from there to play oboe. I played first oboe in the Old City High School Orchestra. Got a Doris Duke scholarship mm. on oboe. I was having so much fun, I can't tell you. What, what year was your first Broadway show? Just kind of get an idea of the time here. I graduated high school in 61. Mm -hmm. I went into teaching school immediately. Before the Broadway story, i got to tell you one other short one. Oh, sure. started teaching school. I taught from 61 to 65. In 1965, I got a phone call from a very good friend of mine who had been at Manhattan School of Music. His name was Bob O'Brien, which is not important. Mm -hmm. But he called me to say, I knew he was in the Army Band Program. He called me up. He said, it's 1965. The government is going to be suspending teaching deferments. Mm. So even though you've got a deferment now, you could be called up and you could be pulled into Vietnam. Mm. 1965. He said, I'll tell you what. I'm going to bring you up. He was assigned at that point. He was an arranger, a fine arranger. He was assigned to West Point. So he brought me up to West Point, set up an audition with me, with the colonel, Bill Schempf. Don't try to spell that one. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Schempf, he auditioned me, and at the end of the audition, talked to me after a while. Oh, he told me to bring some scores with me that I had done. Well, I hadn't done much at that point, but I brought what he had, what I had. He looked at them. He said, I'm going to give you a letter. And he, he had it typed out. The letter basically said, if I'm drafted, I present this letter to the draft board, and they will turn my 
two-year draft into a three-year enlistment. It'll be one more year, but I will be guaranteed of not going to Vietnam. Mm. I went to West Point. I had the best three years I could have asked for. Wow. Fab time. I wrote music for the Army Band, the Army Glee Club. They had a string quartet. Oh, we! I had a marvelous time there. That's where I really learned what I was doing. Mm. And while while I was there, they the Glee Club used to do the Ed Sullivan show every year. <clears throat> I did an arrangement for the Ed Sullivan Orchestra, for Glee Club and Orchestra, and Colonel Shem conducted it. But he had me conduct the rehearsals. First mm. time I ever did it. It was a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. And that's that's basically how it all started. Wow. Well, that's yes. that's fascinating. It's a, that's definitely a, a crash course. And there's so many stories oh. like that. You know, the Beatles, yeah. you know, they oh. all those days in in Hamburg, you know, I may be getting the, city, the German city wrong, but, you know, it's like all those days, oh, you know, all that work. And so West Point was kind of that for you. I, I have a kind of a theory, you know, just... Uh, you know, I, I'm not. Uh, I haven't been into theater for very long, but it seems yep. like the time that you came up. I, I kind of call this between West Side Story, and I don't know, maybe, maybe Evita. We'll just say yep. between West Side Story and Evita, I call that the Baroque era of theater. <laughs> and 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 the reason that I say that is, uh, like, if you think about the Baroque era in classical music, you know, or you know, concert music, yeah. Uh, Pushing the envelope, complexity, harmonic complexity, well, counterpoint. Single-handed. Right. Um, it, to me, it's interesting. Bach is like maybe the only composer ever mentioned as a candidate for the best composer ever. Who, yeah, when, when he died, everyone said, well, we need to do something different. <laughs> and so simplify. <laughs> Yeah, Simplify is right. Right. But that whole decade, or really the 60s, especially the 70s, you know, I think about in um, in film music, you had composers like Leonard Rosamond and um, Jerry Fielding and Jerry Goldsmith using 12-tone right. rows in their scores. Goldsmith, Goldsmith is underrated. Oh, yeah. Gold, so underrated. Yeah. People don't remember his name. Right. Unless you're in the business. Right. Um, yeah, great composer. And then, you know, in the world of rock, I don't think we've ever had such complex music. You know, Gentle Giant, Pink Floyd, Yes, Rush. Uh, you know, th these are things you just don't pick up a guitar <laughs> and start playing along I, with. <laughs> I should say this, but I never really followed rock. I mm. never really listened to it. Right. And even though sometimes I hear things and I'm amazed by, the, by what I hear. Right. I just do. Uh, what's the opera Pink Floyd did? The Wall? No. Uh, well, they did The Wall, and then uh, The Who did Tommy. Uh, yes, yeah. It was yes. The Wall that I heard. Yes. I was amazed by what I was hearing. Right. You have Superstar and some of the other things. Incredible writing. Right. Well, and also, uh, you know, just a little, as a film music fan, uh, Michael Kamen got his start writing for writing for that. And uh, yes. uh, the, the I forgot the guy's name. De Laurentiis, the guy who who directed or produced The Dead Zone, he was a fan yeah. of The Wall and says, I want that guy to write the film music. And that was four <laughs> years later. <laughs> yeah, how people get into things, it's amazing. Oh, yeah. Nice. Um, tell us about uh, getting a job with Annie. Were you there from, I, I didn't. I wasn't able to find out, were you there from the beginning or did you come in uh, later in the process? Uh, I came in near the beginning. Mm -hmm. Peter Howard, musical director, he brought me in. I would say the middle, oh, maybe six months into the show. The first Annie, I think, was still there. Mm -hmm. I'm not positive, but I think so. And I did the rest of the run from their house. Wow. Was seven years, whatever it was. And when Peter left the show, I did the last four years or something like that by mm -hmm. myself. Wow. Nice. Um there's a lot, a lot of uh, actresses played Annie during that time. Uh, yeah. Who, what are some of your most fond memories? <laughs> My favorite Annie, and I mean, I'll say this, but <laughs> a lot of people are going to hate me for it. Sarah Jessica Parker mm. was the actress. Mm. She could hold the audience in the palm of her hand. She was incredible. The others didn't act as well as she did. 
She was not the best singer, but she was good enough. And she was wonderful in the role. We had the we had great things happen in that show while she was there. Hmm. We had Dorothy Loudon had just left the show. Uh, Marsha Marsha Lewis came in as Miss Hannigan, but we had some great people in that show, and I had I had a ball. Right. Well, for me later on, you know, it was it was uh, it was interesting to find out that Sarah Jessica Parker. That's really where she got her big start uh i'm 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 of the age where i first came across her in the movie flight of the navigator and yeah. uh and i didn't know who she was at the time i i knew her by name in the steve martin movie la story yeah and that's fun most people know her from the show the tv show uh sex in the city yes most yeah. people know her. yeah it was not her best, but that's where she made her name really right and then she matthew broderick who surprised me i never realized he could dance and sing mm -hmm. he's more did you see the producers yes yes he was so good in that it was incredible mm -hmm. and uh, if i'm not mistaken aren't the aren't the two of them together in uh currently in plaza suite yes they are mm -hmm. i would love to see it i can't get into the city i'm stuck here mm. that's well, all right so uh you know just just taking Sarah Jessica Parker as an example, or any any Annie, what, what is it like uh, for for them to come in? They don't know the book at all, and you get to teach them from scratch. What, what yeah? What what's that process like? No different from teaching anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them know some of the music songs, like the song will come out tomorrow. Everybody knows mm -hmm. on the show or not. But Charles Strauss wanted it sung exactly certain way mm. and the problem with what he wrote for the for the for the children in that show is that it really went up too high the range was much too high for children children's voices but they never changed it martin charnin liked the way it sounded and they kept it that way so when we had children come in to audition we had to push them up and we never let them hurt themselves but it was a stretch. Sarah came in. She had the range. She sang the song. And as I said, she acted beautifully. Kind of just shifting directions just for a moment. You know, this yeah. podcast is first and foremost about the experience of being in the pit. So yeah. what, what kind of, what size orchestra did you have? And, you know, what maybe what are some of players you really enjoyed working with? On uh, Annie, I think it was 26. I'm not positive. Mm -hmm. I would have to count. There were three, no, no, there were five reeds, three trumpets, two trombones, the second trombone, double tuba, two plectrums, two guitars, upright bass, two percussion, and strings, uh, three violins. Actually, one was a solo. The first violin, Herb Sorkin was a great player, was a, he had a solo violin chair. There's a lot of solo violin and a lot of solo cello in that show. It was a period sound, mm. and they tried to make the orchestration sound like the '30s. Mm -hmm. For the part they did; they were pretty good. Did, did you did you work much with the orchestrators on the show? Did you have to have any collaboration? Okay. No, I after that was all done. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, I have just the twenty six pieces. Uh, I'm I'm just imagining what a Broadway producer would say now if he. Said like a twenty-six piece orchestra. <laughs> it's just kind of well, evolved over the years, you know. Or you know, it's, it's trend, trend and smaller, you know. Well, still up in that in that size, depending mm -hmm. on the show. Mm. Some of them are smaller because there's so much electronics. Right. You have a drummer who has electronics. Right. He's heads with all kinds of sounds. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a lot of it. It yeah. was a lot of it. It was just, it was beginning. I was one of the pianists on Cats right. when it opened. Mm. The original pianist was, oh, now I can't remember. The conductor at the time, I think, was Stan Lebowski, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. And he brought me in as a keyboard player. And I had to learn my way around the synth. I never played one. They had synths called Cat 5, was mm. the name of the synth. Never knew one. I never saw one. Hmm. Wow. I was I was the first on my block 
with a computer mm-hmm. in 19, geez, I don't even know the year. Look up the TRS-80. <laughs> right. right. You remember that? Uh, I, I, I didn't, but uh, I, it was mentioned to me that you actually, you, you did some music demos to kind of help it, sell that, right? The TRS-80 was one of the very first home computers. TRS stood for Tandy Radio Shack. Mm. 80 stood for the S80 chip, mm. which was the chip. And it was a game playing chip. They adapted it for the computer. Um, so the TRS-80 was a very early computer. I used to go into the pit when I was playing. Uh, I forget what show it was. But I used to bring a yellow pad with me. Mm-hmm. And I was during between the numbers. And I would sketch computer programs. Wow. I would take them home. I would key them into the computer. And I'd be darned if they didn't run right the first time. Wow. Yeah. And I, I was told you stored them on, like, magnetic cassettes. Yes. <laughs> Ready for audio cassettes. Mm. We connected it to the computer with a with an audio modem. Mm-hmm. We put the telephone into the cradle, and it made the most god-awful noise. Right. <laughs> and it screeched. My mother hated it. <laughs> right. And... Uh, an acoustic coupler, that's what it was. Right. It was an acoustic coupler. I was contacted by a fellow who was actually, he became the treasurer of Local 802, the musicians union in New York. He was the, he had a shop in New York. He sold computer parts and early computers. He had a gadget called the Orchestra 80, which was made for the TRS-80. Mm. And but he, nobody had a demo for it. Hmm. He knew that he could do a demo. He called me up, paid me what I think was a fair sum. It was a pittance, right. but I had fun. Hmm. And I did some demos for that, which were given away with the Orchestra 80. It was the first time anybody had ever heard the thing. I had a ball. Wow. Nice. Um just before we leave, Annie, you know, I, I just always like to ask, you know, especially since you you spent so many years on that show, yeah. are, are there, uh, are, is there a, a really fond memory, and also is there is there like uh, something that went wrong this memorable? <laughs> <laughs> something that went wrong. Well, <laughs> it's the time the dog threw up on stage. Mm. We had a fellow playing the part of the butler in the Warbucks mansion. Yeah. His name was Doe, nicest guy in the world. So, of course, when the dog threw up, you know who came up to clean it? No. The butler. <laughs> that time, Marcia Lewis, who was playing Miss Hannigan, well, I have to preface this by saying there was a treadmill on the stage, a moving treadmill. He used to carry a set off hmm. so they could walk. And it would look like they were walking next to a, a set that was moving. Mm-hmm. The set was actually stationary, and they were on the treadmill. Well, Marcia had a huge loose bathrobe as Miss Hannigan. And she went off that treadmill one day, and she got it caught in the treadmill. Oh. And I saw it happen, and I had to call the stage manager and say, <laughs> so what was his name now? Jack, Jack uh, anyway, Jack, I can't remember his last name. I said, Jack, stop the treadmill. <laughs> What's the matter? Marsha's bathrobe is caught in the treadmill. <laughs> well, she took take the bathrobe off on stage. So they took her off on the treadmill, changed her off stage, and she walked back on. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the kinds of things that happen right. in a show you know, when you don't expect them. Right. Nice. But those are the they have two favorite moments, the dog throwing up and her bathroom getting stuck. Right. Um, you know, some of the uh, listeners have asked some questions uh, in advance, sure. and uh, and I was going to put them all at the end, but one that I think would be timely to ask now is, uh, you know, what is the collaborative process like, and how does the process change with working with different collaborators? And I think of, like, you, you've you obviously had connection with Stephen Sondheim, Bob uh, Fosse yeah. and um, you know, and you know, just several other directors. And uh, you know, yes. what what are, what is 
What well, are some of the per- differences in collaboration? I, I first met Bobby doing uh, auditions for Pippin. Mm. I was auditions. He came in, we talked, and at one point he said he liked what I was doing. Would I like to work with him? I said, sure. So he hired me, not sight unseen, but he really didn't know anything about me as far as my creative process. Mm. But I went in on that movie. I did dance arrangements for the film. Mm-hmm. And I'm only I'm one of the only people who has three credits on that film. Right. I as an actor, credit as a dance arranger, and credit as an assistant to I want to get the title right. Uh, I can't remember. I think assistant to the sound editor or something like that. I did sound supervision on set. But uh Right. And just to, just to clarify, we're 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 currently we're talking about all that jazz. Uh, the yes, film, so, yeah. Unfortunately, people confuse all that jazz with the song "All That Jazz" from Chicago, which doesn't actually happen in the movie. <laughs> oh, and the funny thing is, I am now in an assisted living facility in Waterbury, Connecticut. Mm-hmm. The head of the programming division always asks people what they'd like to see, and a lot of them request "All That Jazz." Oh, wow. I had to go to him and say, no, you don't want to show that here. Why? Why? Because it's actually got open heart surgery in the movie. Mm. It's a story about Fossey's life, his heart attacks. Oh, it's not a pretty film. No. It's a film. I, Wonderful. I just rewatched it because I hadn't seen it in 20 years, and I wanted to have, you know, just fresh in my mind. But, yeah, it's amazing. It's a masterpiece. Working with him was a pleasure. The one time I worked with Sondheim on anything other than just playing in the pit was on Merrily We Roll Along. Mm. Dance arranger on that show was Tom Fay. They were working on the end of the first act. The end of the first act, uh, do you know much about the show, Merrily We Roll Along? I, I'm sure I've played a couple of songs from him as an accompanist, but I, I don't know the show that well. Well, the show runs backwards. Mm. It starts with the end, and as it runs down to the beginning, you see everything happening in advance. Mm. So just before the end of the first act, two of the lead characters, one of which was Jason Alexander. Mm. Oh, wonderful cast. Anyway, they're talking about how they're going to ha- get they're gonna get married and have a fabulous time, have a great life. But just before that, you find out that they've been divorced. Mm. Everything backwards it was based on a play i'm trying to, um, the play may have been the same name i don't remember but it was a pulitzer prize winning play with the same story and it also ran backwards i wish i could remember what it was it doesn't matter right but some decided to make it into a musical it was one of the only shows that he did that flopped mm-hmm and there were a number of reasons people really couldn't follow the story but he brought me in to do, now let me rephrase that, he didn't bring me in. Hal Prince needed somebody to work on a finale for the first act as a dance arranger. Tom Fay had been working on it for a few days. He couldn't give them what they wanted. So he was not successful at that. Jonathan Tunick was the arranger. Jonathan knew me from a couple of other projects. Jonathan and I used to share a desk at Chelsea Music which was run by Maddie Pincus, Matilda Pincus. Right. She was the copyist for all the Broadway shows for many years. And uh, Matilda knew me, Jonathan knew me. So when they said they needed a new dance arranger, Jonathan actually recommended me to Stephen, which is how I got it. I went in, I sat, and I watched the end of the first act, and I had tears running down my face. And Stephen looked at me, said, what's the matter? I said, I just got divorced. Hmm. The timing was terrible. Hmm. But I gave him exactly what he wanted at the end of the first act. They were very happy with it. It it stayed in the show for quite a while. I don't remember if it did at the end. But Jonathan and Stephen loved the dance arrangement that I did so much that if you listen to the overture, most of the dance arrangement that I did at the at that point in the show is in the overture. Mm. 
very Latin feeling, kind of like a Paris Prado Mambo. Right, very out of character with the rest of the show. Tom has got the credit on the album as Dance Arranger, but I don't care. Yeah. I get paid for it. I don't care. But, uh, oh, so from that, I went on to do dance arrangements and choral arrangements for other shows. Right. I did a couple of real flops. I was just talking with Bob Marks, mm -hmm. who I think is the one who recommended me to you. Right. I actually gave Bob his first Broadway job. I was doing Annie, and I brought him in to play piano for me. Mm. I was hired to do all that jazz. And it took me away from Annie for a couple of a couple of weeks right. on and off, mm -hmm. and I needed a job, so I brought Bob in to do that. There's uh, f four questions I've bookmarked that I definitely want to get to because I yeah. think we've kind of organically covered a lot of it. But uh, since we, you know, I want to chat some more about all that jazz, and one of them was, um, what is the process uh, when you're collaborating on doing dance arrangements with Bob Fosse? Well, basically, it's basically the same as doing dance arrangements with any choreographer, although there are some who really go overboard and they'll say to you, now I want the brass to do this, mm -hmm. and they don't know what they're talking about. If they know what brass are, it's lucky. But Fosse was really very well versed in music, very well versed. And if he said he wanted flutes, he meant he wanted flutes. Right. My my favorite work on that film was what he calls the hospital hallucinations. Hmm. Three women in a row. Each one does a solo bit, solo dance. Yeah. They were the three hospital hallucinations, and they were t we took old songs. I don't remember what they were anymore. And we did new arrangements of them, almost in a ballet form. Mm -hmm. He told me basically what he wanted and left me very free to do what I wanted musically. Mm. And then he worked with it. Some, are, uh, some choreographers are very, very specific. Uh, Sugar Babies, Ernie Flat knew exactly what he wanted. He had Ann Miller, he had Mickey Rooney. He knew what they were going to do, and he told me exactly what he wanted. It was good. Uh, what kind of instructions were you given regarding structure in advance? Like, did you have to do certain number of counts or measures of a, of an A section, or how did that work? Not on all that jazz, no. Okay. Bobby left me very free on that, on the, on the hospital hallucinations. He left me very free. Hmm. The end of the film, which was the rock concert. Yeah. He was very specific. He knew exactly what he wanted. He told me how many counts. He had a, a dance captain and an assistant. Oh, no, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember the name. Gene, Gene Foote, I think, was the guy. And, oh, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember her name. Girl and a guy, too. Very, very well, well versed in music and in dance. Mm. They were who converse, they were able to translate what Bob wanted to me mm -hmm. in terms of counts. Bobby would say, well, I want them to do that. I want them to enter. I want them to do this. And then they would come to me and, I say, and they would say, I need four eights mm. or three eights, whatever. Nice. Yeah. A lot of people who aren't into music don't realize musicians count in measures, bars, Dancers count in eights. Right. Even even if it's a waltz, three, four, they still count in eights. <laughs> right. You know, you know, a lot of times when a when a composer or an arranger works on film, it's in post production. But it yeah. sounds like most of yours might have been pre production or in production. For the most part, it was in it was in pre production. Mm -hmm. I did work with my brain isn't working today. The orchestrator. Oh, come um. on. Was it Ralph? Uh, yes, Ralph Burns. I worked with yeah. him in rehearsal and then again in post-production because I was able to tell him exactly how he how Bobby wanted what I wrote to sound. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, what I wrote was pretty obvious. 
from the way I wrote it, what it, what it had to be. I wrote something that looked like it was brass. It was brass. Right. I, I wrote something that looked like it was strings. It had to be strings. Mm-hmm. So it was pretty easy for Ralph. But he did a great job on that film, of course. Right. Nice. Um, I was... Uh... <laughs> So I was recently watching that film, and I was kind of curious about your experiences as an actor. And the first question I had was, was it as hot as it looked? Everybody is just sweating profusely in that. Yeah, the, the, I was in, <clears throat> sorry, I was in three or four sequences in that film. Oh, I was thinking of the, the very, the, there's a very extended dance sequence where first he's yes. rehearsing them, and then they go through the whole process. Yes. It's like the very middle of the film. Yeah, uh, well, the beginning of the film is what they call the cattle call. Right. All of them on stage, mm-hmm. crowded on stage, 150 dancers crowded onto the stage of the Alvin Theater where it was shot. Mm-hmm. And Bobby was up in the balcony with an earwig and a microphone, lavalier mic, and he was talking to Roy Scheider, mm. who was wearing... Earbuds, Roy Schneider had never done any dance, didn't know a thing about dance. Wow. But but it fooled you at the end of that movie. Hmm. You see, you watch him in the cattle call. He goes over to people. He taps somebody on the shoulder, lifts her leg, it indicates do it this way. He had no idea what he was doing. Bobby was telling him all that in his headset. Wow. Balcony, from the balcony. Mm. Took us two days to shoot that scene. Yeah, I was just thinking. You know, I guess I'm I'm from the South, where um, you know I, I've as long as I've been alive, you know, air conditioning is a, is a way of life. And, yeah, <laughs> and I was just looking at like all those rehearsal scenes. It's like it, you know, you could tell like there's no air conditioning. People were hot, you know, <laughs> and so forth. No, in fact, they would go around and spray us ah. to make us ready. It looked like we were ready. Nice. Actually, yeah. We weren't hot. The the rehearsal hall scenes were shot in the Astoria Studios in Queens. Hmm. And they rebuilt, very faithfully, reconstructed Broadway Arts, which was a rehearsal studio at 54th and Broadway, where the film was rehearsed. Hmm. We created that rehearsal studio so faithfully that when we got to the Astoria Studios... We walked up a, pl- a like a gangway, mm-hmm. and there was a door there, a wooden door, with a green tennis ball in the door where the handle was supposed to go. Because mm. at Broadway Arts on 54th Street, that's the way it was. Wow. They radiated every speck of dust, I swear. Mm. It was incredible. Wow. The first, day, the first day we were there, this is an off-the-wall story. Bobby used to like to play mind tricks on people. And he did it on purpose to set a mood Mm -hmm. and to get the actors and the musicians to work right. Roy Scheider, as I said, didn't know anything about dance, but he he shadowed Bobby for a week, watching every move. Bobby used to meet us at the studio, first day of rehearsal. He would be crouched down on it, on with uh, he'd be squatting, and he'd be in a corner of the rehearsal studio, and he'd be sitting there with his cigarette like this. Every day we came in, we knew not to bother him until he got up and spoke to us. That was his signal. We knew he was ready. We got to the Astoria Studios. We walked in, and there he is in the corner, squatting down with the cigarette. We were quiet. We came in. There was rain coming down on the outside of the windows on the set. Mm-hmm. It was an illusion. They had water coming down. Mm-hmm. So it looked like rain. It was dark outside the window, all to create a mood. We walk in, and all of a sudden, he stands up. It wasn't Fossey. It was Scheider. Wow. <laughs> he created a scene for us. <laughs> that was the kind of director he was. He got exactly what he wanted by playing a mind game. He really did. He was great at it. 
Wow. It's, it's quite a fascinating experience, especially having just recently watched that, you know, it's a, yeah. and it's a, it's a great film, but yeah, it, it probably, you know, just worth, especially for like younger listeners. I know I've got some high school and college students. It's like, yeah. uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's an edgy film, you know, it's a, but oh. it's a, it's a very well-made film though. It's very well made. It's very dark. Yep. It's very, very well made. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Just a few other questions. I'll kind of uh, yeah. I'll throw in here. Uh, one was uh, the the way it was asked was, do you have a wish list of productions that you didn't get to music direct, but you wish you had? And I'll just add to that: yeah. are are there are there music? Well, so are there also musicals that you just really love that you were not involved with? Yeah, West Side Story is one. Mm-hmm. Uh, Fiddler on the Roof is another one. Mm-hmm. I had nothing. With either one of them. In fact, they were both conducted by Charles Jaffe, who was another friend of ours from from my youth. Mm. Charles and Hal Hasten used to live in Forest Hills, right? And my parents and the Jaffe's and the Hastings Hanwagers were very close. Spent a lot of time together, and Charles. Conducted both of those. I wish I had done them. I don't. It didn't matter if I conducted them. I, I just would have liked to play them. They were such great shows. Mm. But you know, there are a lot of good shows. Right. One of my favorites that I never got to conduct is one that most people don't remember. It's called Baby. Mm-hmm. You know, Baby. I, I don't know that one. Very unusual show. It was conducted by Peter Howard again who was the original conductor of Annie. Mm-hmm. He brought me in to play keyboard before I had a chance to play the show closed. Mm. I was just also curious, uh, you know, music, obviously the, the style has changed of musicals over the years. Oh, Are, yeah. Is there anything, though, in the past maybe 20 years that has stuck out that you that it's surprised you that you really enjoyed? Yes, Secret Garden. Mm. I liked that. I watched it. I never never played it. Right. Never had I it from the audience. Mm-hmm. I thought that was a fantastic show. Yes, it uh, is. This is sacrilege. I'm not crazy about Andrew Lloyd Webber. Mm-hmm. I, I've I'm, heard that before. That's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. No. I saw cats from the front. Yep. I saw it from the basement, from behind stage. I'm just never crazy about the show. It was a very well done show. Yeah. It deserved Every accolade it got, but it was not my favorite. Uh, I never saw Evita. Mm-hmm. I never saw Phantom of the Opera. Mm. I did Phantom of the Opera in Summerstock in Connecticut. Yeah, but I never saw it on Broadway. Yeah, I've I've heard I've heard I've heard things like that about about Lloyd Webber before. You know, I mean, that, and I you know, and I like I appreciate the way you said that. You, you know, you. You can respect something without personally liking it. Oh, yeah. I do respect him. Yeah. I respect good. Yeah. Of course. Right. It's just an interesting question. I, th- I think, you know, you do something like All That Jazz, you do something like Annie, and, then, you know, the question was, did you have any understanding at the time of how impactful it would be even 50 years later? Oh, I did not. Mm. I think the favorite thing that I've done that had to do with Annie if you go online onto Google mm-hmm. and you look up, it's going to sound strange, Sarah Jessica Iwo Jima. Hmm. Sounds strange, yeah? Right. On Bob Hope's 75th birthday, he did a broadcast from the Iwo Jima in New York Harbor. Yeah. Sarah Jessica and Sandy the dog was on were on the deck of the ship and I was in the background conducting Les Brown's orchestra. Mm. They went wherever Bob Hope went. So I conducted and there's a video of me conducting on YouTube. Yes. So if you look up Sarah Jessica Iwo Jima, it'll take you to that. Nice. I've seen that and I'll I'll share that in a link in the show notes. Yeah. Great. Uh, let's just see if there's anything else that uh, I think there was at least one other question. Oh. Uh, well, well, there is there is one other question. What advice would you give to aspiring music directors? 
listen. Yes. Listen to everybody. Don't necessarily believe it all, but listen. <laughs> That's advice. Because you will hear things that are totally wrong, and you will hear advice that you should listen to and is totally right. It really depends on who says it. Working with Stephen Sondheim, he always said the right thing. Always. Uh, Jonathan Tunick was the same way. He said something and you knew it was right. Always. I've worked with directors and choreographers. Pardon the expression, they didn't know their brass from their oboe. <laughs> It's, it's not original. I don't know who said it first. Right. I don't know who said it, but yeah, there were some some musicians and music directors that didn't know a damn thing. They should not have been in the business. And some of the nicest people to work with were on stage, and some of the worst people to work with were on stage. I will not mention names. That would not be right. Mm -hmm. It would not be fair. But there was one who used to go out at the end of the show, he'd be the first one first one out of costume. He'd be changing as the bows finished. He'd already be taking his clothes off. Hmm. Run off, get out the stage door, and sign autographs. Hmm. That was one. Hmm. I will not mention his name. It would not be right. Uh, I won't even tell you his initials. <laughs> <laughs> and then, again, there's... The opposite of that is true, too. Doing industrial shows was a great experience. They don't do them anymore. If they did, that would be the thing I would suggest for every musical director, every pianist. It was the best education I could have gotten. I'll give you an example. We went to Las Vegas to hire. No, we didn't hire it. The, the uh, Dodge Chrysler Company hired the convention center at Las Vegas to do a show announcing the new models. Couldn't tell you what year it was. The show featured Tony Bennett and Dionne Warwick. Hmm. You can't get bigger names than that. I had worked with Tony Bennett once before with the American Symphony Orchestra and they were doing a benefit for the America Israel Culture Foundation ex Culture Exchange, sorry. Right. And Benner was before me. So were Alan and Rossi. So were, I don't remember who else. It was a, a star studded night at Madison Square Garden. And his pianist was late, Tony's pianist. Tony carried the same pianist for years. I cannot remember his name. I'm embarrassed. Hmm. I knew him. When, it's just eluding me. Anyway, he was late. He couldn't make the rehearsal on time. And Tony had just recorded San Francisco. Most people didn't even know it back then. I loved that recording so much. I listened to it over and over. Then it came in to rehearse, and his pianist wasn't there yet. The, old, the whole opening of that recording, the whole introduction is just piano alone. And they had orchestra parts, but they didn't have the solo piano part because the pianist knew it. Well, Tony came in to rehearse and his pianist wasn't there. The assistant conductor with the orchestra knew me very well. I played piano with the orchestra and percussion. And he said, by any chance, can you sight read this? I said, I don't have to sight read it. I know the recording. I know every note of it. Mm -hmm. I'll play it for you. I did. I played it from memory. Tony was amazed. <laughs> years later, years later, when we did this industrial in Las Vegas, he saw me. He remembered me. He called me by name. I couldn't believe it. With all the people he worked with, he remembered my name. <laughs> and it was such a joy to work with him. He was so good. Anyway, yeah, there were some people you just remember as being great. Yeah. And then, like I said, there are some people who are impossible. Right. I've had both. I've had both. Yes. I mean, it, it takes all kinds. <laughs> um, I, did, I didn't mention to you what happened to me going into the Army, though. Hmm. I wrote, I, oh, I did tell you that I was the arranger for the West Point Army Band. Yeah. 
I was moonlighting from the Army, which was up at West Point, Highland Falls, New York, hour and a half from New York. I was moonlighting. I was playing shows at night. Mm -hmm. I was doing KP in the daytime and coming back and doing shows. I went into one called Oak Calcutta. I loved the music from the show. And we had, as the arranging department up there, we had the ability to write anything we wanted for the Army Band. Mm -hmm. And it would get played. So I decided for the marching band, I was going to write an arrangement of the main theme, the opening theme for O Calcutta. Hmm. And Colonel Schimpf loved the arrangement, played it every chance he had. Without telling me, he programmed it for the Army-Navy game. It was broadcast nationwide. Well, we got a call at West Point from the publisher, Robbins Music, you didn't get permission to use our music. Hmm. You didn't pay rights to use it. So he asked me to come in to Robbins, bring every copy that I had of everything. If it was a drum part, a second French horn, it didn't matter. Bring every scrap of paper. I brought it in. I thought for sure I was getting reamed out. No. He looked at what I brought. He looked at the score. He said, you know, this is very good. Do you want to write for us? <laughs> <laughs> so I started working for Robin's Music as one of their staff arrangers. Huh. I did an arrangement for elementary school of a, a song called Sunny by Bobby Hebb. Hmm. Very popular for a while. And I was written up in the Instrumentalist magazine, which was a magazine for music teachers talking about new arrangements, good ones, bad ones, I'm sorry, new arrangements, not new arrangers. Right. They, they wrote a, a article on this arrangement of Sonny. And the very first sentence was, finally, an arranger who is not afraid of using dissonance in elementary school. Hmm. I had the, the, opening of that, the opening of that score had the second clarinets playing an E, and the third's playing an E flat. Mm. Nice. It's the kind of thing you shouldn't do, but I did it and it worked. Yeah. Nice. It was so much fun writing for them. Educational market does not pay very well, but I enjoyed it. Right. Arnie, you've been very generous with your time, and I know that we could continue oh, we could continue for, for you know two or three hours with you still have plenty of stories. Um, I gotta I gotta put in a plug. Yes. Did Bob Bob published a book. Yes. He's a wonderful book. Okay. So I got to put the plug for him. Okay. All right. And we'll add, we'll add that title in the, in, uh, in the post show notes here. And uh, yeah. I guess the last question I have just would be, what what is theater life? Do you have theater life anymore, or are you completely retired? No, I'm completely out of it. Uh, theater is in New York, and I'm in Connecticut. It's, right. It's way too hard for me. I can't even walk much anymore. Right. My knee bad. I use a rollator wherever I go. I, I can't do much. Now I read. I an, work, I'm sorry. I read an article that you have at least in in maybe in the few few years ago worked with some local high school on their production. Yeah. yeah, I worked with the Canterbury School, which is a private high school in New Milford. Mm -hmm. Very very good school. Mm -hmm. And yeah, they wrote up an article about me on that. I don't even know where. I think it was in the Waterbury News Times or right. Public, and I don't know. It's available somewhere online. Everything is online. Right. You can't you can't live anything down. <laughs> it's hard to try. Right. Uh, yeah. The I worked with a, a director named Matty Dreek. She was a blessing, Madeline Dreek, and her his husband Robin was the set designer and did all the, the did all the construction for the shows there. They had a great department. I enjoyed it. It was one of the only times in my life that I've worked with amateurs. Not the only time, but one of the only times. I've done summer stock. I've done, you know, the usual. Right. One of the biggest theaters I've ever done was the Municipal Opera in St. Louis. Hmm. Well, 14,000 on the hillside, something like that. Wow. Um, 
Yeah, uh, like I said, we could we could keep on going, uh, but again, you've been very generous generous with your time. Uh, it's sure. great to it's great to hear about just all these stories from, you know, just a a, a time that's you know before the time of a lot of our <laughs> listeners. But but it's, it's just, done. Done. but you know, there's a lot of things that you said that that are still the case. Uh, almost every pit musician I've had on here has talked about the importance of sight reading and the importance yes. of good relationships and how you tend to get your jobs because of people you, you meet who, and, yeah. and sometimes recommendations from those people you yeah, meet. So that hasn't changed. You don't go looking for the jobs. Very often the jobs come to you. Yeah. And I was very lucky. I worked hard, but I was lucky. I made some very good connections and it paid off. Right. Well, again, uh, thank you so much for taking time to chat with me today. Very, very welcome. It's my pleasure. And that concludes my interview with Arnie Gross and episode number 67. And uh, just because I, uh, once again, I said that uh, I would mention the book title uh, that Arnie referenced of his friend, Bob Marks. That book is called 88 Keys to Successful Singing Performances. Uh, so definitely would encourage you to go check that out, uh, especially if you are a, a vocalist um, or if you know one and you're looking for gift ideas. Just want to make sure that you are subscribed wherever you are getting your podcasts. Uh, I am hoping to have another episode in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's a possibility it might be an extra week longer. I do not yet have the next guest uh, either recorded or solid, solidly scheduled yet, but I am working on uh, actually a couple of interviews. So hopefully I will have that ready in two weeks. But if you are subscribed and following, you will know when that next episode is available. And of course, as a reminder, if you want to follow what's coming up next, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Life in the Pit Pod. You can follow me on Instagram at David Lane Music or on Twitter or Facebook at David M. Lane Music. And a special thanks, as always, to Mark Perillo for his cover art and to Bill Cisna for providing the introduction to this podcast. The theme music is composed and performed by David Lane. You can find out more about the podcast, leave feedback, or leave a donation at lifeinthepitpod.com. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, and please share with your friends. Thank you for listening.